Arunang karuna tarangitakshi Drita pasang kusha pushpa bana chapam Anima di biravritam mayukhai Raham mityeva vibhavaye bhava Deva Shigana Sanghata Stuya Manatma Vaibhava Bhanda Sura Vadho Dyukta Shakti Sena Samanvita Namaste and welcome to the next episode of Sri Lalita Sahasrana. So these thousand names are not just an intellectual or academic or even religious exercise. They are a profound form of mystic yoga. So because the names have many hidden meanings, they have, first of all, they have bijaksharas, powerful mantric syllables hidden within them. And also, each one of the names references a much broader context, a story, in fact, huh? as we'll see with these two names, which begin the section describing her conquering Bandasura. Bandasura. Well, we'll get into him in a little bit. First one, Devarshi Ganasangata. Stuya Manatma Vaibhava. So, from this Nama through Nama 84, describes the, her killing Bandasura. Devarshigana is built up from Deva plus Rishi plus Gana, as in Ganapati. Huh? That this is a group of demigods and sages. So the demigods and sages were very much harassed by Bandasura. So they went to Devi and all the sages like Narada, Vasishta and so on, and all the demigods like Indra, Varuna, uh, Agni, Vayu and so on. And of course, Lord Brahma, head of the demigods, they went to Devi and they asked for help. So it's very interesting. Um, Stuya Manatma means to worship or pray in the mind. So the demigods and the rishis, especially the sages, they don't worship anybody other than the Supreme Brahman. Of course, they respect the other demigods and like that but they don't actually worship them. Huh? So if they are going to goddess Lalita, this means they consider her as the Supreme Brahman. And we'll see in this Sahasranam many, many namas that confirm this, that she is actually the Saguna Brahman. Saguna Brahman is one of the five tattvas We'll get into tattvas later. I'm going to do a whole separate series on it because it's an, the ontological basis of all the uh, Sri Vidya. Um, but there are five tattvas that are non-dual and Shakti is one of them. Uh, so the non-dual tattvas mean that they are as good as Brahman. And to approach them, to worship them, to do seva to them is as good as worship of Brahman or contemplation or meditation. Uh, and this is why bhakti to any of these Shiva, Shakti or you know any of her forms can give liberation because she is actually Brahman. Now uh, that means she's all pervading and 
of course, like all other qualities of Brahman, are present with her. Who is this Bandasura? Huh? Bandasura. Now, as I've mentioned several times, the names of the demons in these works, uh, Puranic works, are hidden clues. Huh? So Asura, of course, means demon, but Banda, Banda means a joker, a fool, like a juggler or a mime, you know, someone who tries to entertain by doing stupid things. <laughs> so this is Banda Asura. He's a fool, he's a joker, huh? he's an idiot, <laughs> but he's a powerful idiot. So let me tell the story of how he came to be. In the very early days of the universe, the demigods were trying to establish themselves as the masters of the universe. And they had a problem. <laughs> Human beings weren't following them. They weren't worshiping them. They weren't offering oblations to them. And so the demigods were kind of like bereft, you know, they were starving, they had a problem. So, of course, they went to Ma, they went to Lalita, and they said, well, what can we do? How can we get these human beings to follow us and worship us according to the Vedas? So, Lalita came up with Manmata. Manmata is Cupid. He's the god of love. And he has these same weapons, the sugarcane bow and the arrows of flowers representing the senses. And so he went and fought with these weapons against the human beings. So what does that mean? It means the human beings became overcome with lust. They wanted this, they wanted that. They wanted so many things. They had so many desires. Uh, that they began to worship the demigods in order to satisfy these desires. Previous to that, the human beings had no desires. Uh, they were all like enlightened. <laughs> they didn't have any need to worship anybody, except Brahman, of course. But Brahman doesn't give material benefits, see. So faced with uh, these increasing desires, the human beings then had to take up the worship of the ritual worship of the demigods. Nice trick, huh? Except Manmata got uh, a little bit, you know, too big of a head. And one time the, the demigods were trying to see Lord Shiva, but Shiva was so deep in meditation that not a breath of air was stirring around him for hundreds of miles. Such deep silence he was in. So the demigods tried to come up with an idea. How are we going to get Shiva out of his meditative trance? So they called on Manmata, <laughs> Cupid. Come on, attack Shiva with your arrows of flowers and give him some desires and bring him out of his trance so he can help us. So Manmata said, oh no, this is, <laughs> this is too much. But he did it anyway. And of course, when he, when he shot these arrows of desire at Shiva, Shiva woke up and his third eye opened and burnt Manmata to a crisp. <laughs> But then he, kept, he uh, kept going in a subtle form, and that's the way he exists today, in the subtle form of our desires. So because he was burnt, there was a pile of ashes on the ground. And Ganapati, Ganesh, you know, because he's basically, he's a young boy in his temperament. Huh? He starts playing with these ashes and he adds a little water and he starts, you know, molding them into a kind of a human form and he starts playing with it and so on. So 
Parvati goes to Shiva and says, why don't you bring this form, this toy to life? And then Ganesh can play with it to his heart's content. So Shiva, just by his glance, he brought this doll made of ashes to life. And this is Bandasura. So Bandasura conquered all the demigods. He took over heaven. He even kicked Lord Brahma out of his place. And he began to accept all the offerings meant for the demigods and even wrote his own Vedas <laughs> to, so that described him as being supreme and so on. What a rascal. So this Bandasura, he had boons from Shiva. He pleased Shiva with his austerities and Shiva gave him certain boons that made him unconquerable. So really, only Shakti could conquer him. And so this is the, the basis or the backstory of these next few names. Next, Bhandasura Vadhodyukta Shakti Sena Samanvita. So she's always ready with her army. Uh, her army is very powerful and it includes all kinds of superhuman creatures, divine lions and tigers, huh? and Narasinghas. She has millions of Narasinghas that are, that are a kind of a cross between a human being and a lion. They usually they have the head of a lion and the body of a human, but sometimes it's the other way around, like the Sphinx in Egypt huh? has the the body of a lion, but the head of a human. <laughs> so, you know, anything is possible. She can come up with any kind of creatures that help her. And actually, she doesn't need them at all. This is the funny thing. Because she is the existence, she could simply stop the existence, the being, of Bandhasura or, or anyone. Uh, but she plays according to her rules. See, she created the law of karma. So she doesn't violate her own laws, even though she could. So what she does when somebody creates a big disturbance in the universe is she creates this mystical army and goes after them that way. So there's a couple of secrets in this Nama. Bhanda, as we, as we uh, discussed before, can mean a joker, a fool, huh? a jester, something like that. So Bhandasura is like that, he's a fool. So allegorically, he represents the human ego. Huh? Ego is a fool, he's a clown, he's an idiot. He's just a jester, you know. The ego is someone who doesn't exist or something that, that doesn't really exist, but which is simply a projection of the mind. And yet people worship this ego and sacrifice so much and are even willing to die sometimes for their pride and their ego. So just see how people are bewildered, conquered by this bandha. So because someone has lack of knowledge due to ego, there also the banda. See, there's banda, banda, huh? with the tongue on the roof of the mouth. And then there's banda, with no, no dots underneath. Banda means bound, tied up. So when someone becomes banda, they also become bandha. <laughs> when they become a fool, when they develop ego, uh, when they fail to serve the purpose of the goddess, they become also bound. That means they are tied down by their karma. They can't escape it. So the way to liberation then is to conquer this ego, huh? 
to get the knowledge by which one can transcend limited individual existence. And in that way, we achieve the perfection of self-realization. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.